How many of you have ever worried about losing your hair, or have already noticed signs of hair loss? Those blasted hair follicles start misbehaving, and then we have a decision to make. Are we just going to accept it and let it all go, or are we going to intervene with some sort of treatment option? But it can be difficult to know where to start, because I'm sure you've seen multiple ads on potential treatments or solutions to restore hair loss. And so today, we are going to take a look at what causes hair loss in the first place, and of course, discuss some of the methods that have actually been shown by research and science to help slow or even restore lost hair. It's gonna be a hairy one. So let's do this. The most common type of hair loss in males is referred to as male pattern hair loss or androgenic alopecia. Alopecia refers to hair loss and androgenic refers to hormones known as androgens, which are male sex hormones that are involved in producing masculine characteristics. And as we'll see, also part of the cause of hair loss. Now keep in mind, females also produce androgens, but in much smaller amounts. And females can also have androgenic alopecia. However, it is less common than in males, and the pattern of how the hair is lost, meaning where on the scalp the hair is lost from, is also different. And because of these differences, some prefer not to use the term androgenic alopecia in either sex, but rather use the terms male pattern hair loss and female pattern hair loss. But what causes this type of hair loss? Well, to understand this, we get to go over some quick anatomy of the hair follicle. Hair follicles are actually an invagination or a downward growth of the epidermis that occurs while you're developing in mom. As the follicle develops, the base of the follicle pushes into a nipple-like structure called the dermal papilla. This dermal papilla is important because it contains tiny little blood vessels that provide nutrients for the cells that are in the base of the follicle. And as the cells divide, they are added to the bottom of the hair, pushing it further out of the follicle and contributing to the overall length of the hair. Now what is really cool is that your hair follicles have different phases of growth. An active growth phase, or the antigen phase, followed by a regression phase, also called the catagen phase, where the base of the follicle actually shrivels and pulls away from the papilla. And then a resting phase, also called the telogen phase. For the hairs on the scalp, the resting phase, or that telogen phase, will last about three months, and then the follicle will enter into another active growth phase, and the old hair will fall out, and a new hair will start to grow in its place. And normally people lose about 70 to 100 hairs each day because of this process. But the growth phase is the phase we are most concerned with when it comes to progressive hair loss. And something also important and interesting to note is that the length or how long the growth phase is differs for the follicles of the scalp versus say, the follicles on your arm. The growth phase on your scalp can last anywhere from two to six years, sometimes even longer. But this explains why hair on your head can get so long. But I used to say to my students, could you imagine if the growth phase for the follicles on your arms lasted just as long as the follicles on your scalp? We'd have like hair flowing off of our arms, like hair wings flowing in the wind, if you will. But of course, us humans are kind of weird, so we'd probably do things like try to crimp it and braid it, and now I'm going a little bit too far. But anyway, the growth phase is important for our hair loss discussion because what starts to happen with hair loss is that the growth phase starts to get shorter. And this leads us into an important discussion about the androgen known as dihydrotestosterone. But real quick before we get into how dihydrotestosterone contributes to hair loss, I do wanna take a second to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video. But I do wanna do it a little bit differently than I normally do. Today's video is sponsored by iRestore, and this is an iRestore Elite device. But let's get a little serious for a second here. Obviously, I'm doing a video on hair loss with a sponsor integration for a device that is used to help with hair loss. For those of you that have been watching us for a while, hopefully you know that we wouldn't do a sponsor integration if we didn't believe in the product and also wouldn't integrate a product if it didn't have scientific backing for its effectiveness. And spoiler alert, later in the video, we are going to directly talk about how low level laser therapy, such as this device, is an effective option for hair loss. But the reason I prefer this device compared to other devices on the market is due to its quality and its enhanced coverage of the scalp. It uses Lumatech technology that consists of 500 medical grade lasers and LEDs. And because it uses both lasers and LEDs, you can get more uniform coverage and thorough treatment of all the hair follicles. It is also FDA cleared and is a medication free option to help with hair loss. And as I've mentioned, has been clinically shown to help support hair growth. 
It only needs to be used for 12 minutes a day, and the triple wavelength power ensures deeper and more effective treatment that can help enhance cellular metabolism in the scalp, improve blood flow, and reduce inflammation, which are factors that can contribute to hair growth. So if you're interested, visit the link on screen and use our coupon code IOHA to get $625 off the iRestore Elite device. We'll also include that information in the description below. And let's get back to dihydrotestosterone. Dihydrotestosterone, which I'll refer to as DHT, is a potent metabolite of testosterone. Testosterone is converted to DHT in the hair follicles of the scalp by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. And this enzyme will also be important when we talk about the different treatment options for hair loss. Once the testosterone is converted to DHT, the DHT will then bind to the androgen receptor in the follicle, and it affects the follicle at the level of the dermal papilla by activating genes that cause the gradual transformation of a large terminal hair follicle into a smaller hair follicle. This is important to understand because terminal hairs are thicker, longer, pigmented hairs. But when the large terminal hair follicle transforms into a smaller hair follicle, this smaller follicle will have a shortened growth phase, which then produces a very short, fine, thin hair known as a vellus hair. Sometimes vellus hairs are referred to as peach fuzz, but in the case of hair loss, the growth phase gets reduced so much that it produces a vellus hair that is so fine and short that it often doesn't even make it to the surface of the skin, giving the appearance of baldness. This whole process is known as follicular miniaturization. And this follicular miniaturization is also associated with a reduction in the size of the dermal papilla. Remember that was important because the dermal papillae contain the blood supply for the hair follicle. And obviously, as more and more follicles transform from larger follicles into smaller follicles, the coverage of hair over the scalp decreases, and this is what causes the overall look of hair loss. And it is also important to note that this process, this androgen-dependent process that we've been discussing, does require a genetic predisposition to hair loss because obviously not everyone loses their hair. But nonetheless, genetics plays a large role that is complex and is still being studied. But don't blame your mom's dad. That's a myth that I was told growing up that if my grandpa on my mom's side was bald, I was going to lose my hair. You'd actually be much better off blaming your dad. For example, there was a study of 572 males aged 16 to 91, and they found that participants under 30 years old with a balding father were more than five times more likely to have male pattern hair loss than participants of a similar age that had fathers that were not balding. Not a guarantee that you'll lose your hair if your dad did, but obviously a much higher risk. And now that we have an understanding of how hair loss actually works, what options do we have to treat it? The two main goals for treating hair loss would be to prevent further hair loss and possibly even restore some of what has already been lost. And again, I'm sure you've heard of various supplements, procedures, light therapy, massage techniques, and all sorts of different treatments or remedies for hair loss. But what treatments have actually been shown to be effective? Well, luckily, there's definitely some data and research to back up various treatments. But like many treatments, there are pros and cons to each approach. So we'll try to address these pros and cons as we go through each option. Topical minoxidil and oral finasteride are the first options we'll talk about as they have some of the most data to support their effectiveness. And because of this, they are often the mainstay or the initial treatments in the medical community for hair loss. And then of course, we'll go over some of the other treatments that have also been shown to be effective. You've likely heard of the brand name of minoxidil, which is Rogaine. Minoxidil is thought to promote hair growth by increasing the duration of the antigen or that growth phase, while shortening the resting or the telogen phase, as well as by enlarging miniaturized follicles. One of the ways minoxidil is thought to accomplish this is that minoxidil is a vasodilator, which helps to maintain the vascularity and the size of the dermal papillae, thereby giving more blood to the follicle. The pros of minoxidil is that it has been shown to be effective for the treatment of hair loss. And since it is a topical treatment, it is much less likely that a person will experience systemic side effects. Some cons are that some people can experience some allergic or contact dermatitis, although most people don't experience this. Also, people using this should be aware that during the beginning of treatment, some extra shedding of hair may occur due to minoxidil stimulating the follicles to move from that resting phase back into that growth phase. But this is temporary. Finasteride is another option for hair loss. It inhibits the 5-alpha reductase enzyme that we talked about earlier. 
Remember, this enzyme converted testosterone to DHT. The typical one milligram dose of finasteride can lower DHT levels by more than 60%, which means if we decrease the overall amount of DHT, much less of it will bind to the DHT receptor at the hair follicle and therefore help prevent the conversion of those large terminal hair follicles into those smaller hair follicles that we discussed earlier. Some pros of finasteride is that some studies show that it may be even more effective than minoxidil. It's also a tablet taken once a day, so pretty quick and easy to take rather than having to take the time to apply something to the scalp twice a day like minoxidil. But the fact that it is a pill also comes with some potential drawbacks. Since it is swallowed, more of it enters the bloodstream than a topical medication and therefore creates a potential for more side effects. Some reported side effects are sexual dysfunction, such as decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, and even gynecomastia has been reported, which is the development of glandular tissue of the breast. But keep in mind, many people don't experience these side effects, but you'd want to discuss this with your medical provider. Often people are willing to try this, and if they experience any unwanted side effects, they could decrease the dose or discontinue the medication altogether. Also, some studies show that combining both minoxidil and finasteride can be even more effective than just using one alone. The minoxidil kind of working to wake up or re-enlarge those smaller follicles, and finasteride working to prevent any further conversion of those larger follicles into smaller follicles. But it is important to keep in mind that if someone were to discontinue either one of these medications, the hair regrowth that they had established will likely be lost over the next several months. Another form of treatment is low-level laser therapy, sometimes referred to as photobiomodulation. And this uses devices such as specialized combs, helmets that we've already been introduced to in this video, or other devices to deliver red or infrared light to the scalp. Now, the mechanism of action of how they work is not fully understood, but it is thought that they can stimulate hair growth through acceleration of cellular mitosis, stimulating the mitochondria within the cells of the follicle, thereby increasing ATP production, enhancing blood flow, and or through minimizing inflammation. A pro of these devices is that they, again, have been shown to be beneficial for hair loss with multiple individual randomized control trials showing a greater increase in terminal hair density and hair count. Another pro that some people think of with these devices is that they feel that they are kind of a little bit more like natural, I guess you could say, because you're not taking oral or topical medications. But some people will also opt for combination therapy like maybe using a topical therapy combined with the use of one of these devices. Now, some potential drawbacks could be the initial upfront cost and adherence, meaning you have to use them three to four times a week, sometimes every day, anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes at a time, depending on the device. But for many people, this doesn't bother them that much as they will wear them during downtime, like reading a book, watching TV, or while filming a YouTube video. Hair transplant is another option for hair loss, and this is a surgical procedure that involves the extraction of multiple follicular units, which are groups of hair follicles that contain anywhere from one to four follicles. These follicular units are extracted from non-balding areas of the scalp, and these are most often removed from the occipital region of the scalp, the back of the scalp, as the occipital hair is typically resistant to male pattern baldness. These occipital follicular hair units are then transplanted to an area of the scalp that is affected by hair loss. These surgical sessions can last anywhere from five to eight hours. For example, a small hair transplant session may involve the transplantation of 800 to 1,000 follicular units, whereas a larger session could involve the transplant of three to 6,000 follicular units. And this can be a very effective way to establish growth in balding areas. But with every surgical procedure, there are associated risks, such as the potential for infection, skin necrosis, and scarring, to name a few, but these are relatively uncommon. Also, it is important to understand that there are ideal candidates for this type of procedure, and these would be people that have stable or medically controlled male pattern baldness. For example, if someone started recently losing their hair, and they were losing it relatively quickly, it wouldn't be wise to just jump straight to hair transplantation prior to the hair loss stabilizing on its own or stabilizing through some of the treatments that we've discussed already. Because you wouldn't want to have a transplant and then continue to lose the hair afterwards. Also, this brings us to expectations. In general, the sooner one intervenes with hair loss, the better. Because you can get to this point of no return with many of the hair follicles, 
where they can't be salvaged with many of the treatments that we've discussed. And that doesn't mean I want to discourage you if you are further along in the hair loss process. It is more of creating realistic expectations that if you have lost a lot of hair, you can get improvements, but it's not like you can get completely back to your original Asgardian Thor-like hair. And a few quick honorable mentions. Things like platelet-rich therapy, also known as PRP, as well as something like microneedling. Both have been used to try to combat hair loss, and there have been people who have reported benefits from this. However, there's still some uncertainty to their effectiveness. Many of the protocols have not been standardized, and some of the studies have some mixed results. So as we are waiting for more data and research on these, you may want to start with some other treatments before exploring these options. So hopefully that gives you a good understanding of how hair loss works and some potential solutions that you can explore if this is something you're concerned about. And a random fact, did you know that you have an amazing little muscle that connects to your hair follicles that causes goosebumps? If you're curious about how that works, meet me over in this video about goosebumps, probably somewhere over here on the screen. But I do want to say thank you so much for supporting our channel. We could not do this without you guys watching our crazy anatomy videos. And of course, we'll see you soon.